Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, so we are having our first panel of the fall quarter. Uh, this is the tech industry panel. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with kind of how we do these panel events, um, I have some scripted questions that I'm going to ask our panelists. I'm going to have them introduce themselves. I'll ask a few questions. And then for about the last 30 minutes or so, I want to turn it over to you guys, the students, and give you an opportunity to ask questions. So please, while we're while I'm getting the panelists warmed up, uh, you know, answering and talking about their experiences, think about things that you would like to ask them, um, things that might be relevant to all of the panelists, or if there's a specific uh, question for um, a particular panelist or company that you want to ask, um, please write it down. And then, like I said, once I turn it over to you, it's going to be a chance for you to ask. Uh, so pretty straightforward process. Um, so let's get started. So first, um, I want the panelists to introduce themselves. And Pamela, how about you start us off? Sure. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, it's really nice to meet you all today and be here. So my name is Pamela. I'm currently a strategy analyst at Google. Um, so Google is super big. So just to give you guys some context about um, what I'm working on. So I'm team is working on one of the products from the Google Ads platform, which is called auto apply recommendations. So it's pretty much provide um, recommendations to all of the advertisers um, to let them know like what specific things that they should do in order to improve their account performance. Um, so as an analyst, my role is um, really to using like data analysis and A-B testing to um, um, like test the part of visibility, like design seller incentive rules to increase the pitch rate or running machine learning to understand user behaviors, etc. Um, so before I joined Google, I was an analyst from eHealth, which is an like, e-commerce company in the insurance industry. Um, you can think of it like a Amazon, but for selling insurance plans. So um, where I focus on sales analysis, like how to make the call center more productive and marketing analysis, analysis, like how to grow our customer base or like retention analysis, like how to improve customer retention. And that's it. That's my experience. Great. Thank you. Jake, how about yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi, it's nice to meet everybody. My name is Jake. I work for DASI uh, here in La Jolla. Um, technically, we're full remote, but that's where their headquarters um, is. I'm the technical account manager lead. Um, and so what that means is I work with a bunch of our different merchants. Um, they're in, primarily in the e-commerce industry, um, and we take their data from all their different sources, whether it's you know Google, for instance, for their Google Ads data or Shopify and put it into a single BI tool uh, for them to, to use. And then we help them with analysis, uh, primarily focusing on uh, sales initially, but then channel attribution for marketing and um, LTV and RFM information, uh, customer information. Um, and before that, I was a student. So this is my first job uh, since I've been in the program. Thank you. Mong, how about yourself? Sure. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Mong, and um, I'm currently working at Thumbtack for about almost three years now. And uh, I'm a product analyst. I just uh, got promoted to senior. Um, but uh, I have been really enjoying the thank you. I've been really enjoying working here. It's a marketplace for professionals. And uh, Thumbtack, it's at Siri I, I believe. It's launched in uh, 20. 2008. So we're actually older than Uber. Um, but hopefully we can go IPO soon. That's why I'm still here. And uh, I worked on currently I'm working on a new product that we are going to launch pretty soon. Actually, part of it already launched is home care. And the other part is actually launching late this month is membership. So which is very exciting and I really enjoy it. And for the past two years, I worked under growth team, so pretty much customer growth to uh, grow the product on different um, web platform as well as iOS uh, and uh, native, including iOS and Android. Um, before that, I was in a media agency called Havas Edge. Um, I was the attribution analyst for like nine, 10 months, and then I moved to data science team for three months. But at that time, I actually, uh, Thumbtack was my client and it was my like toughest client ever. 
So I just reach out to them, say, hey, I'm interested. Um, and can I join you guys? And then that's, I just went through all of the interviews and then got um, the offer from Thumbtack. And before that, I graduated from MSBA in uh, 2017. What a fabulous way to network, Mong, into your next role. That's awesome. And yeah. last but not least, Joseph, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Thank you, Jeanette. And thank you for all the other hosts that I attended tonight. My name is Joseph Young. I am the director of product at MobilityWare. I've been here for a year. Today is actually my anniversary. Uh, and what we work on here at MobilityWare are games for mobile apps. So the most popular one that we have is Solitaire. It's been in the App Store since 2008. Uh, we also have Spider, Free Cell, Pyramid, Spades, Heart, Sudoku, um, and many other games that we work on. And my day to day is spent uh, reviewing the KPIs for these games, uh, trying to uh, find more users for our games, and then using the data from um, our players as well as from the reviews to help plan future features and roadmap planning and staffing planning for the team. Previous to MobilityWare, I was at Jam City for five years as a director of product as well. There I was working on two games called Cookie Jam and Cookie Jam Blast and some other titles that will hopefully be released in the future. Um, and then prior to Jam City, I worked at a variety of companies, including Disney and Navtech and Nokia. You're still muted, Jeanette. My bad, thank you. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about uh, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you need to, to do what it is that you do at your job. And um, Jake, I want you to start us off. Tell us some things that you, some deliverables that you need to do for your job, and what are some like commonly used hard or soft skills that you need to have every day to do the work that you do? Uh, yeah, the, the biggest one, and I cannot stress this enough, is being able to talk between people that don't understand data and talk to people that do understand data. Um, it is literally, it's, it's why I have a job. It's my, it is all I do is they come and say, Jake, I need X. Okay, well, what do you mean by that, right? There's a thousand different ways. And to give you an example, um, a merchant that I'm working with was categorizing their, uh, their customers based on one, two or three sales, right? Um, and then whether or not, and so they added a new metric where they wanted to add in a fourth, if they purchased a fourth sale, they were a different tier, but then also using 0.1% and they wanted a cumulative count of that. Well, what do you mean by that? Because that changes, is it four purchases in a month? Is it four purchases ever, right? And so you have to build those test cases out and then to be able to take that ask and explain to them and then go to some analysts and explain why that's happening and how to do it correctly is easily the most important thing that I would I would urge you to to work on. Yeah. So it sounds like communication is really important in being able to, to, to thoroughly explain things, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, working like using the MSBA program as an example, when you would, I know it was a fear of everybody, but you know, when they ask somebody to present, to be able to present and walk through exactly what you did in a way that's concise and explains it to somebody that hasn't worked on what you were working on before. Mm -hmm. um, that is absolutely uh, the most important thing. Joseph, how about for you? What are some some everyday skills that you need to, to use in order to do your job? Sure, yeah, I'll break it down by the categories you brought up. So I think for hard skills, I would start with things like SQL, knowing um, data analysis tools like Excel, Google Sheets, and then also learning new um, tools. So, you know, depending on what company you go to, you may could, you could be using Tableau, you could be using Looker, you could be using BigQuery. So just the ability to pick up new technologies is something that's really important. And I think the classwork that we used was, you know, quantitative analysis and the presentation skills was also something that was really important for us. Um, whenever my team does data analysis, they also always have a presentation at the end of it so that they can explain to stakeholders, you know, what the A-B test was, what we are trying to discover, what the null hypothesis was, what the data revealed, um, you know, objectively, and then what our conclusion is. So uh, another hard skill beyond just the analytical part is putting together the story, kind of like what Jake was talking about in terms of direct communication. Uh, but that leads more into the soft skills. So I think communication for alignment, negotiation, um, kind of getting agreement among team members is something that is something that I have to do a lot of times, especially at the organizational level. And getting buy-in is something that uh, takes a lot of different skills depending on 
the person's personality and how you're working with them. Uh, your last question was on deliverables. And for deliverables, you know, the thing I'm working on right now is our roadmap plan for 2022. I think regularly I'm delivering kind of roadmap or KPI reports in terms of how well we did in the month of September, what we plan to do for October and November, December, um, or you know how we did for the third quarter and what we plan to do for the fourth quarter. Those are a lot of the deliverables that I focus on. Great, thank you for answering that. Uh, Meng, how about for you? Yeah, I I really completely agree with Jake and uh, Joseph mentioned earlier. Um, I think it really depends on the role because we are all in tech industry. And uh, I think Joseph was working like a product management um, and then I am analyst. So in, in tech, like I think a lot of things is I can only speak to the analytics part. Um, for PM, they will have like another different skill, skill set. Um, but I think a couple ones I will mention here is number one is like um, deliverable. It's like knowing your audience and how like when you're actually doing presentations or talk about different level of the stakeholders, you will really need to interpret it in different level of details. It's like what Jake mentioned earlier, it's like they you will have to be able to talk very specific, very detailed data with like managers or someone really know about data. But on the other side, when you talk with like CEOs or senior leadership, they don't need to know that much of a detail. And that's really like a presentation skill that know your audience. It's also very important. Um, and the other one is, yeah, we are at the planning season as well. So there's a lot of like nuances, especially when we're trying to launch a new product you really need to get the ambiguity um, comfortable with those ambiguous like questions or numbers and then trying to make the most sense when you present it to um, senior level of the leadership. Um, that actually was like a very big part of our Q4 um, planning and going into 2022. So that's been actually take a lot of time. Um, I think the last one I will probably mention is it really depends on like each level. There's like junior level analyst, there's senior level, there's lead, there's manager. And from my past experience, I think proactive or really speak up when you see something different or the leadership is really another point of the um, skill I would advocate everyone to like learn from. It's like when you, the data person really see a lot of details and informations that other people cannot see. So, they really need your help, especially PMs or engineers or designers. They need your help to tell them what are the insights from the experiment that we're running. And then you will need to speak up to really suggest the solution or suggest the insights. And then trying to push the team to come make to agreement and then actually make the product to move forward or align on the same goal. So a lot of times, like I have a lot of experience working with PM. Um, they will be always like, let's hit the goal, let's like ship it and let's run 10 experiment in the one quarter. And I tell them like, hey, it's, I am the only analyst and you run 10 experiment. Yes, you can do it, but I am not be, a, I'm not able to tell you the insights. Like we only have like 10,000 people right now. It's the audience and you can't really split them into like 10 bucket. Then I can't tell you anything. Nothing is that sick. So yeah, that's another part that really speak up when you have opinion in your head and you are the data person and you are really trustworthy. So yeah, that'll be probably the last point on top of everyone already mentioned, which is great. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I think that's really insightful because it's important to know like what you can or you can't do with the data or what sort of insights and just kind of helping people understand that. Sure. Pamela, how about for you? What are everyday common skills, deliverables, uh, things you need to know in order to do your job? Yeah, um, so I agree on everything that um, people just said. Um, I, and also I can only speak for um, analytical part, like how to do the job as an analyst. Um, so I would say like the foundations um, to do my job, it's definitely like technical skill, like Joseph mentioned earlier, the skills that you um, like use all of the different data tools, how how your like skill of writing SQL, writing Pythons. But one more thing to add on that is um, your um, data rigorousness. So which means that you have to understand whether your data is reliable, it's accurate, and where does your data come from? 
So can it match the data with um, people that who get from the other data sources? So this is extremely important um, because um, if you can't even get your data right, then every insight and every ideas, um, opinions that you extract from that data will be problematic. And um, and for all and for all of like the experienced stakeholders who look at your insights, they will just like find that out immediately. So they will notice like the difference. So which is really um, bad for your presentations if you do that. Um, so another thing to add is um, I think like strategic thinking become like more and more important for an analyst, especially. Um, when you grow in your career. So maybe as like a junior analyst is not that important because you just need to execute what you are assigned to. Um, but as you grow like to senior or even like um, lead or like manager, you need to um, take the lead of a, an analytical project to see how you can actually stop it. Um, so to do it, um, I mean like to the I think like the points to um, be good at strategic thinking is like always be um curious about what you're happening like in your teams in the projects that you're working on or even in the projects that from other teams so um like having curiosity can help you like grab more contacts um you just like learn more things um so just like to give one more um one example is that um like i shared with jenna earlier i'm working on the projects that um um, figuring out whether we can promise our customer to see whether like everyone who up in our products, we can guarantee of X percent of like account performance increase. Um, so at first beginning, when you heard of this, this might be an, like a big and ambiguous like project. You didn't even know how to solve it. Um, but actually you just like need to start by asking the right questions. Like, um, like, what do you mean by performance increase? Like, how do you define performance? Like, do you mean conversions or revenues? And um, how, um, who are the target customers? Like, can we promise the same percentage to every customer or we ha actually have to segment that? And how long can we guarantee like this performance increase? Like for a year or for three months or um, just for other um, length of time? So by asking all these questions and answering all those questions, you actually have the ability to, to deliver a really like solid reports um, to the stakeholders and to your managers. Fantastic. Thank you, Pamela. Let's talk a little bit about trends. So what do you see are some trends going on maybe in, in this industry? Um, where do you see your company going in the next five to 10 years? And maybe talk a little bit about how COVID has impacted your business. Meng, how about you kick us off? Sure. Um, okay. I hope my company can go IPO in five years, um, which I'm hopeful. Um, and then we are remote forever. Um, I think some of the companies does it. Um, like there's like hybrid model and there's like different model, but my company is remote forever and there are libraries in San Francisco, uh, Salt Lake City, and that's pretty much it. So I kind of use this opportunity to move to out of the state. Um, so it's kind of very flexible for me. And industry, I see, uh, I think COVID actually made a lot of changes to my company uh, being very focused on home industry um, because like everyone knows like the surge of the housing price and everyone is purchasing homes. So we actually kind of switched the strategy to focus on home care a lot, like maintenance of home. And that's also what I am actually working on right now to uh, grow this new product and also create this like new membership um, that my company is trying to go into. So I am hopeful and pretty excited about the, the future of my company. So um, we do have the goal of like going to like one of the goal for 2022 or 2021 actually was a public company readiness. So which I'm hopeful that uh, we can go public in a um, couple of years. Uh, what well, is that? Did I answer all of the questions, Jeanette? Yes. Yeah, I think you did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pamela, how about for you? What do you think the future holds for Google? How did uh, COVID impact the company? How did it impact your work? What are you seeing? What's on the horizon right now? Um, I mean, like Google is big, so I can only speak for the organizations that I work for. 
Um, so I work for the sales organizations for the Google ads. So what I've seen is, um, you know, there are different sites of advertiser, right? Like the um, big clients like Coca-Cola who spend like millions of dollars per quarter. And there are um, some small advertiser who only spends maybe like a um, couple thousand per quarter. So in Google ads. So previously, um, there are a lot, a lot of efforts um, to focus on the black clients, like how to, um, how can we like match sellers to each customers and then like provide personalized um, like um, experience to them. Um, but what I'm seeing is that we focus more on more on um, what we call the unassigned, unmanaged customer, the orders like smaller cust um, advertiser. So we want to provide um, service to them as well. And we want to pitch and like promote our products to them to try to, um, to, try to let them adopt to um, more offerings, um, the thing, to try more things that Google can offer and try to um, like encourage them to spend more to upsell them. So that's the trends that I observe. Um, and also um, I'm seeing like um, a trends of um, using machine learning. Um, machine learning, I think it has become like plays a more and more important role um, in the company. Um, so we're building like since like two or three years ago. So we built our machine learning platforms. So which enables like people to build machine learning within clicks. Like you don't even have to understand the programming and this complicated statistical um, principle behind the model. Um, there are like numerous trainings and resources to explain each specific parameters or even help you auto tune the models. So just like let you do it. So the result is there were a lot of business people um, they'll run the models too, like just with the help of the analysts to help them to extract data and they can like just run the model. So um, the teams, like we don't need data scientists to do it. So the applications of machine learning is wider. So, and which means like the company is becoming more and more data driven. And we need like data to support every decisions making. Um, does it answer all of your questions? <laughs> this is the trends for yes, um, yes. the company. I love these thorough answers. That's so great. Joseph, how about for you guys? What's on the gaming horizon right now? How has COVID yes. impacted your business? Tell us. COVID was good for our business. When everyone was locked at home, they had nothing else to do but play video games. So uh, we saw, we called it the COVID bump when you know, when everyone was sent to stay at home, we saw a jump in engagement from our players. Um, we've seen that recede a little since the vaccine started rolling out and people started trying to normalize their life, but um, the, it still stays elevated prior to what it was before the pandemic, which is great for our business. Um, I think the other thing that the pandemic has done is changed our working environment. You know, I think three years ago, I would be down there at Rady giving this talk with you guys as students. I think now that we're in the pandemic, um, we've all, a lot of us have switched to work from home and mobility wear is also similar a lot within the game space. I mean, I, th I think the games industry is very much similar to the tech industry where a lot of companies have gone to either fully remote or a hybrid solution. We're still, in, we're kind of in the hybrid solution right now, but it's, it's pretty flexible for our employees. And that has been um, very, and we've been able to stay productive and continue to ship titles during the pandemic. And, you know, what we see for the next five to 10 years is, is more games. You know, I think um, the, the appetite for games, the appetite for content, whether it's media or games or books continues to grow. And uh, there's our players, the number of players that play our games continues to grow and we wanna to continue to develop more games for them. You know, one of our, our mission is to bring joy to players one game at a time. And, you know, we released two games this year already, Bubble Shooter Pop, as well as Gin Rummy. We have new games planned for next year. And um, we're, we're gonna keep building out more and more games. And in terms of technology, I think the amount of analysis that we're doing on our games and um, automation continues to increase. So, you know, every time we launch a new game, there's even more metrics that we're looking into to understand how well the players are enjoying it, to help kind of improve the gameplay experience to, to be better next time. Um, and then we do a lot of automation in terms of um, reporting and um, analysis uh, and trying to build out dashboards and systems rather than ad hoc analysis. Um, is something that we spend a lot of time doing because of the number of titles that we have growing. Um, and if I have to speculate on one crazy thing for games, probably in the next five to 10 years, if you guys haven't heard about NFTs coming in and baiting games, that's going to be probably something that will have a high impact on games. 
um, that I think would be pretty interesting. Whether our company works on it or not, I, I can't say on that, but it does seem like something that will shift the industry for us. What is an NFT? Uh, that's a non-fungible token. So you can assign um, ownership to digital goods uh, with permanence. So if you're playing a game and you completed the room and you have this beautiful room, you could own that room and then sell it to others. And then you could have an ownership token of it that you could then transfer on to others for financial rewards. Oh, that's interesting. No idea. <laughs> Thank you. Jake, last but not least, what's on the horizon for your company? How has COVID impacted things, upcoming trends? What's the latest? Yeah, so uh, for Dacity, we primarily work with e-commerce merchants, I think I mentioned. And uh, so actually when COVID started, there was a really big you know, unknown of what would happen. But since then, it's grown a lot um, because a lot of people shift primarily to shopping for their stuff from e-commerce. People didn't stop buying clothes as much as you would have thought. Um, they actually just transitioned to ordering them online and then shipping them back. Um, so we actually, same type of situation, kind of got a COVID bump, but it's more of a trend now where it's just continually increasing. Um, so I expect that to continue. Um, I'm on a kind of similar path with Hmong. I think, you know, I don't know if we'll make it in five years to, you know, an IPO, but I would, uh, I would imagine that that growth rate um, is going to continue at least for the foreseeable future in the next five to 10 years. And I'm kind of hoping to stick around to see all of that happen. Um, and then what kind of trends? I mean, so some of the things that we're concerned about right now, right, is the shipping delay. Um, we're doing a whole bunch of analysis with a lot of our e-commerce merchants about trying to prepare for, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and the holiday season. Um, so that's been a very interesting problem because it's really, you know, it's, how do you, it's hard to quantify uh, at the moment. So um, that's been very interesting uh, to work with. Uh, one of the trends that I see. Um, I don't see us doing as much machine learning as some of the, you know, as some as some of the other people here. Um, reason being is a lot of the e-commerce merchants, even if they are very large, they are surprisingly short with like what they know about their data. Um, I mean, even doing simple RFM analysis is like way better than what a lot of them are doing right now. And so I, the goal is to eventually get there, but we'll probably try and automate a lot of that, which would be, you know, have a standard set and then auto tune it because they one probably don't really understand it that well. And then two, like the return will be better, but once you get to like only marginally better for the amount of work, I don't think they're gonna, they're really gonna care that much. So um, one of the trends that I see are, are the tools, the ETL processes that you use in order to get the data from different sources into like a single format is going to continue to, to be what's important, at least, um, at least in the near term. Excellent, thank you. Okay, now it is time for students to ask questions. And if you guys can, and if you can't, I understand, but if you can, turn on your camera so the panelists can see you. Um, and then we already have one question in the chat. This is from Shrikar. He wants to ask, uh, can you advise on required skills, technical and non-technical to crack a PM interview? And I'm guessing you mean like a product manager interview. Is that right, Shrikar? Yes. Yeah, okay. Who's our product people? That would be Mung and Joseph. You guys wanna talk a little bit about that? Oh, I think I will let maybe Joseph go first or I, I can go too, cause uh, I do interview PMs but only from the analytics perspective. So pretty much what the, my part is we have a case study. So if you look it up online, there'll be a lot of different mall, um, case study interviews that you probably can practice and go through. Uh, there'll be like some uh, bigger pictures or do you have like structure way of solving a problem? And then there will be some calculations inside. Um, yeah, and then it's like 45 minutes. So that's only the analytical part of the interview. Um, but the rest of them, I will leave it to Joseph. Um, cool, yeah, I would usually partner with someone like Meng and then I would be like, hey Meng, can you quiz them on all of the data analyst stuff and make sure that they're super technically sound. Um, and then um, coordinating with her, I would probably take on things like roadmap planning and feature analysis. So maybe Mong would work through them like an A-B test or analysis. And then I may work on a candidate and say, hey, you know, um, what do you like about Gmail? And, you know, what would you do to improve it? 
how would you measure that? How would you set that up as an A-B test? And then kind of work through different case studies like that. Uh, I think the other thing that I would kind of recommend people is to practice and not just practice in your head, but practice either in front of a mirror or into a video camera, because that there's a really big difference between interviewing in your head and interviewing in a mirror and interviewing a camera. And I think the people that do that practice usually present a lot better. Can I jump into, I don't, I don't yeah. interview uh, a lot of people, um, but I do deal with um, a lot of the people that we hire. Um, one of the things that I would try and uh, I try and get good at, I would act like, and I'm not just trying to, 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 to say this is I would use Jeanette's resources a lot. Um, and the reason that I would say that is because, you know, using, going through the questions and answering those is one thing, but I'm going to pry you on it. And if you don't have an answer, that's not a good start, right? It's it, going back to the why things work and everything. If you have that rehearsed answer and, uh, you know, to Joseph's point about using the star format for a lot of those questions, absolutely 100%, but I'm going to ask you a follow-up question and I need to understand that you understand uh, what you were saying, not that you just, you did it. So, mm -hmm. right. And so when we're talking about the star format, for those of you who have been through my interviewing workshop, that's for the behavioral questions when you have to tell me about a time you did X and you have to tell a story, stands for situation, tax, action, result. It's a way for you to frame your story in a structured way that kind of gets the point across of what you did and what you achieved. And yes, I, I do do mock interviews and I, I ask all kinds of behavioral questions all the time. Because like you guys said, part of it is telling the story right and that's really that's kind of one of the most important pieces is can you tell the story and can you you know clearly articulate the result that you got um while we're talking about interviewing let's kind of keep going with that pamela tell us about google and the interviewing process at google i know it can be an intense and lengthy process i bet students would like to hear about it yeah um it the interview process for um Google, it depends on the positions. It actually varies a lot. Um, so generally, I would say like most of the positions in Google are like general hire. So unlike like other positions, you might not know what's the team that you work for and you, you might not know who's your hiring managers and stuff and who's your teammates during the interview process. So um, what will happen is that um, they'll have like, um, let's say it's like three or four teams, they collaborate to hire like two peoples. There are two headcounts. So um, we'll have this like technical rounds um, where we test like SQL um, or asking like statistical questions during the interview. Um, and we'll have like behavioral rounds where we have like, um, we'll call like hypothetical questions it's exactly like the case studies that you guys mentioned. Case study questions, and then we'll ask for your past experience. Um, and also um, like we'll give you some cases like under um, that team specific situations to see whether you can solve similar questions. Um, so um, each of the rounds, they will have like a pool of questions. So to make sure that they ask similar questions to different candidates. So no matter who is your interviewer, um, the questions are actually select from the exact same pool. Um, but it will, but um, the interview itself actually will tailor a little bit subjectively based on what inter um, who is the interviewer. So um, it's, that's pretty much it. And then after you go over like all the different rounds of interview, you go to like a team match phase. So whereas like um, all the hiring manager and the host will discuss like um, who is the candidates that they want to move forward to. And then um, they'll decide from there to see whether they will give you an offer or not. I've seen people like who um, get like positive feedback for each round, but then like there's no hiring managers um, would love the profile and the feedback from the candidate pool during the team match um, process and if you kept, couldn't get an offer or um, the other way around um, if a candidate get like a medium feedback from one of the rounds but um, one of the hiring manager really love your profile then you still have the chance to get an offer in the team match um, round thank you other questions, you can either put them in the chat or if you wanna be brave and ask it, you know, uh, through your video camera, that's fine too. Come on, what other questions do you guys got?
they're gonna ask a question. Come on, you got four experienced people up here. And I know for a lot of you, you're just getting started on your job searches. Tell you what, did, thinking, going ahead. I was gonna say, did they uh, improve any of the SQL learning with the MSBA program? Like more, did they offer more courses for SQL? I believe, yes. I believe it's more involved if an MSBA wants to jump in too. But yes, I think now it's part of a part of some of their courses that they take that they get more SQL. Yes. Yeah. And I think that was actually even feedback from your class that got implemented into the future cohorts. Let's see. Ah, Justin's got a question. Thank you, Justin. He says, any recommendations on most helpful classes at Rady? Yeah, let's talk about leveraging the Rady experience. Uh, what did you think was most useful. So we've got three MSBAs and we've got one MBA on here too. So talk about that. Uh, what first, yeah, what classes were most helpful to you? What, what are you using the most uh, in your jobs right now? I can touch a bit on that because I'm still using like a lot of knowledge from Ready. Sure. Um, I think like a lot of classes are really useful. So a couple of them like customer analytics and business analytics experiments and firm. And also, I don't know whether this is still an options for um, people um, like this year, but back on my cohort, we have the option to select the uh, machine learning classes from the computer science um, college. So where you can like learn, um, like learn on all the like different machine learning, um, their statistical principle. Like you can't just like pull up um, packages to run the um, modeling, but you actually have to write up the whole thing yourself. And this is actually really helpful. Like you can understand what's really going on. So when you apply that, you're not like blindly following the results, um, but you know like why you're picking this model instead of the other. Um, and also I think um, there's one um, classes, it's not technical at all. It's called um, management. Um, okay, I've, I actually forgot the names, but it's actually talking about like confirmation bias and stuff. And the name has like management in it. Um, decisions making, like- Like judgment um, and managerial decisions. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, exactly. So um, I really love that class um, because um, it tells you like, um, I think it's sort of, they sort of tell you like um, the people's tendency of like how, why they're making that decision so that you can know, okay, so um, in my specific cases, like whenever I have to make a decision based on my data, but then I, I can also consider what are the things that I should pay attention to, um, like from like psychologically, so to avoid the bias that I already have. So I think that is really helpful too. What about for the rest of you guys? What about for your Rady experience? What did you find most useful? Uh, I can go next. I, I'm the first cohort um, for the MSBA. And um, I think couple, I, my favorite class was the customer analytics, I think. Mm -hmm. That was actually a pretty hard class. And I really like Professor Nice and he is really nice, but he's also tough too. So, but I actually learned a lot from him, um, like how you should an analyze like customer's behavior or like retention or like CRM model, um, decision tree. A lot of these are actually pretty, still pretty useful uh, moving forward. My job right now doesn't require a lot of like R coding, but it's like required when you actually go into like an interview. Um, a lot of the uh, interview that we kind of asking relates to like A-B testing. And uh, I don't know if we have class related to that, but if not, you can always learn it from Udacity. I think there's actually a very good class um, they posted there. So you can always just learn uh, afterwards for like prefer interview. And SQL is another thing that I use a lot. Um, I think we are offering SQLs now, which is great, but if we didn't offer at that time, but you can always find resources to learn yourself. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We're still, I, I still use a lot of the, the knowledge I learned from MSBA, um, so which is like super helpful. Yeah, I'll go next. Um, I, once again, customer analytics, uh, the best class that there was 
uh, nice is a legend. Um, the the first half of that class, the first like five or six weeks or so are, are the base for my job. Um, that and then uh, Professor Hansen's class, the, the core class, I forget what it was called, but extract like uh, data. Collecting and analyzing large data. Yeah, collecting and analyzing large data. I every day I use the skills. Now I use I use SQL now instead of R. Um, so I would definitely once again echo learning SQL. Um, but I, a lot of every day I you know I'll, I'll have one of my merchants call me and say you know this doesn't look right and you need to go through a massive data set and figure it out. You know a one percent error isn't good if you're a billion dollar company. So you know it's it's it can be hard to find that stuff, right? So that part, um, you know, I think that last, I think that quarter I, before the final, I think I spent like 30 hours doing everything in, in order to make sure I did well. And I still do that every day. So I would definitely, I would definitely take Hanson's class seriously. And he's a great professor. So take, take his class either way. Joseph, as our lone MBA, but you're working in a highly technical uh, role, talk about how you leveraged your MBA experience in your career. Yeah, I think there was, I didn't have the classes that you guys had, so I had to learn a lot of that stuff on my own, like customer analytics, I had to kind of learn on my own. We did have, I was looking, thinking about it, we did have a lot of good quantity of analysis classes. Um, the new product development class that I had, I thought was really good. And um, the leadership and negotiation classes, I remember, were also very good. Um, this is going back, you know, 13 years in my memory. So I apologize if I don't remember the class names. Uh, lab to market, I think mm -hmm. the teams that took it seriously and our team took it really seriously was really good. I actually referenced my lab to market multiple times when I was interviewing. I think I referenced it for a couple of years after I was interviewing because we had tried to bring an educational, like, entertainment product to the market. And so we really... In the work that I was doing, which was still games and, and technology, I was able to keep referencing the, the lab to market program that I'd gone through and the coursework that I'd gone through um, at the school, uh, which really helped. Uh, the other thing I did was I did continue to do a lot of the networking when I was at Rady. So I think when I was at Rady, we did a trip to the Bay Area to meet with tech companies. We did trips to companies in San Diego and meet other companies in San Diego. I think that's another great way to, to get networked and connected with um, businesses so that you have opportunities in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Plus one to social networking, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, let's see, we have a question from Ji Peng. He says, hi all, thanks for sharing. I would like to know whether you guys have any suggestions about writing a resume. Ooh. For example, if I don't have any gaming industry experience but would like to apply for some relevant jobs. Besides including some projects and past experiences related to the job description, what um, other points should I add to the resume to gain a bigger chance of getting an interview? And yeah, I think that's a great question. If you're coming from outside of an, uh, an industry and you're trying to break in, uh, what do you think are some good ways to do that to make your resume stand out? And since he specifically mentioned gaming, Joseph, let's start with you on that answer. Well, I have to agree with the audience. You have to go to Jeanette first. That's, that's number one with the bullet. Oh, so we'll start there. Um, because I think you, you always give sound advice. And, and if I think what, what you would advise is make sure that um, the, the things in your resume reflect your passion for games. And uh, when we're hiring people for games, you know, if you show that you have a passion for the industry through the work that you're doing, then, then that can show itself, whether it, it could be a streaming channel. So if you have like a Twitch account, if you shared that, then that would be interesting. But I would only care if I saw that you were like streaming regularly, right? If I go to your Twitch page and there's like one video of Jake doing one data analysis that I'm going to be like, eh, I don't know if I really like this guy, right? But if I see like Jake has a video log every day of him streaming and like and I watch his stuff and I'm like, wow, Jake knows what he's talking about when he's kind of breaking down these games analytically and, and looking at the numbers on it, right? So I think um, trying to align your resume with the industry that you're going into and then also being like results driven. Um, and then I think the other panelists have talked about it in making sure that you have like showing the strong results in, in what you're delivering with your work. And so making sure that your resume doesn't, doesn't just talk about like the classes you took, but actually the results that you delivered either on your team or on your internships, I think that's what, what matters a lot more. And I think combining those two together is, is kind of how I'd push into an industry that you're not active in already. Just to be clear, I don't have a Twitch. So you won't Liar. find it. <laughs> um, 
No, I would also, something similar too is um, like a lot of analytical experience is relevant, even if you don't think it is. It's all about framing it to be relative to the problem, right? And this goes back to um, what I was saying about being able to explain exactly what you did. You know, if you can explain it well, it might not be exactly the same that I'm looking for, but if it's even close, then that's good enough. So that's also a reason I would say work with Jeanette, because you might not think that it's relevant, but if you can frame it well, it probably is. Data is very similar across, it's just different use cases. Go Jeanette. Thanks guys. Any other, any other advice or suggestions? Because it's true. I mean, like, you know, I have, I have one opinion and one style of how I think a resume should look and how it should be worded, but I know there's lots of different opinions and ideas out there about what works. And what I always tell students ultimately at the end is, well, are you getting interviews? You know, is your resume getting attention in the right ways? And if it is, then, then great, keep doing what you're doing. But Pamela among, do either of you have any thoughts about that? Um, I think for me, I didn't really go for specific industry because I didn't really know what I was expecting. So I, I was fresh out of college, joined MSBA. So I did not really have a lot of work experience, but I just have, I just like data. I just like analyzing problems and then trying to make a sense of from those random number. And that's my passion. And then I think what you can do if, if, if you're like someone like me do not have a lot of work experience with analytics, then try to get um, internships. Um, so like as much experience as possible that you can put on your resume that you have the passion to data. And then, then you can go into different industries saying, hey, I, I have this, I have done this before and I had the experience of like gaming and then I really show my passion. I don't think it's really like, oh, I'm applying for a company is in gaming industry. Then I have to twist my resume to fit into the, the industry. I think start from earlier if you, you are getting internship to start and with the experiment or like with the experience of data and then that's already pretty good enough to get you more um interviews or like internships opportunities so that's how i got started um just to slowly get more experience that i can kind of putting a steps up into more uh, long term or like a uh, full-time positions yeah, um, and I think there's one more thing to add on that is um, maybe for like smaller company, like they value more um, whether you have like a um, same industries experience. Um, but for a bigger company, I think what they value most is like what are the things that you do instead of like whether you were in the same industry. Um, so like just in the resumes, um, I when I interview like other candidates, um, I value the most on like whether, um, like what are the things, what are the deliverables, like what data um, model or what mathematic, uh, what methodologies that they use to solve the specific questions and what's the impact. So I think most of the data skills are transferable. So I don't think like you should worry about like whether you were in the same industry or not, like just be real to talk about precisely um, what you did and how's the res and what's the result is more important than relevant experience. Yeah, that's really good, Pamela. Absolutely. And there's a lot, like you said, there's a lot of experiences that you'll have that are transferable or will cross over into whatever industry. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it's just, it's about, it's about though how you articulate it so that it sounds like, you know, it sounds like the things that you would be doing for that position. Absolutely. Okay, let's see, we are, we are almost out of time. Let me do one more question. Any recommended resources for preparing for machine learning and statistical interview questions? Resources for that. I can recommend like some website, like Tour Data Scientist, and um, there's one called... You said it was Tour Data Scientist? Yeah, and there's one called Medium. So those two um, are the other websites that I go a lot, like go there a lot just to browse the articles and some blogs. So um, there are a couple like different types of articles, resources there. So one is to generally explain some um, terms, like all the different kind of machine learning or statistical modeling, like the difference between A-B test and A-A test, et cetera. And also there's another um, type of articles there is like how 
people are using this specific or this specific data skills in their company, like in their team. So you can learn like real world experience there too. Great, thank you for that. Yes, and I believe um, just for my MSBA students, I believe I've given you a link to towards data science probably in the last um, newsletter that I sent out to you where I was giving you some resources on interviewing, uh, especially like technical interviewing. So yeah, that's a great, that's a great recommendation, Pamela. Um, does anybody else have any recommendations on how to get better with machine learning or statistics? Like quick, quick ideas. Um, yeah, I have the resources I always like to recommend to people for maybe my job to interview. It's uh, AB testing on Udacity. I can share the link. Um, this is like pretty helpful because I actually got to go through this class uh, well I'm already got my job but I've realized it's actually pretty helpful for me to understand the basic of like A-B testing which is really used a lot from a uh, product analyst so I would really recommend this if you are going to any uh, product analytics role or like business analytics role for like tech industry there's analysts always like a b testing and uh, trying to figure it out like what kind of recommendation we should ship um what, what kind of recommendation we should suggest and then um if it's like making statistical significance or should we ship it or not so this is very helpful um i highly recommend excellent thank you i'm gonna i'm getting i'm capturing these two by the way because i get requests all the time for additional resources so I'm always looking for new new ones to send to students. So thank you for that. There's one more website. It's not for technical questions, um, but it's for like um, the case study for the part of that interview. Sure. Um, there are like sample answers on there. Like you, you can see like how people answer those questions and try to come up with your own methodologies. Like not recommending like just recite everything that on there, but instead like just digest it and has your own way. Um, yeah, but you can use it as a reference. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Also for case studies. Um, so there's a, a resource on Handshake um, that's called Vault. For those of you who are familiar with it, and then there are all these Vault guides inside of it. There is a Vault guide to case interviewing, which is like case interviewing 101. And it's primarily focused for like more traditional MBA case interviewing, but there's definitely a lot of relevant information in there for students who are kind of like master finance or, or business analytics. Uh, there's definitely uh, useful advice in there as well about how to like crack cases. Okay, we are just about out of time. The one last question I wanted to ask is if students want to continue the conversation with you guys and connect and network, what's a good way for them to do so? I know some of you already put LinkedIn, your LinkedIn URLs in there. Is LinkedIn the best way to get in touch with you? Yes, yes, I see some nodding of heads. Great, yeah, so please, as, as students reach out, accept uh, maybe, you know, if you're available, do some informational interviewing. Um, I know, Joseph, I know you have to be out of here in a few minutes, so I just want to respect your time. Um, guys, stick with me, though. I'm going to send you a survey, a quick little poll. Let me know how useful this event was to you. Um, you, know, you, you know, rate it one to five. Um, just let us know if you thought this event was worth attending.